No one who had ever seen Catherine Morland in her infancy would have supposed her born to be in heroin. Her situation in life, the character of her father and mother, her own person and disposition were all equally against her. Before I get into today's discussion topic of Northanger Abbey, I just want to talk about the piece. So this is the painting I'm basing the, my own painting on. Um, not sure who did it and when it's from. It looks 19th century, but I did search, I couldn't find it. These are the brushes I'm using. Um, however, I did not stick to these in the end because these are my watercolour brushes, but then by the end of this painting, I did it in gouache. Anyway, so I used cold pressed watercolour paper, these watercolours here, and I'll set you off learning about Northanger Abbey. I'll be back talking about art in a bit. You, viewer, may be surprised at such a title. Why would Jane Austen, one of our great novelists, need to defend the novel? Perhaps she had to defend her own works as a female writer, but novels in general? Yes, indeed, she did. Novels in the 18th and early 19th centuries did not receive as favourable publicity as nowadays. Today, reading is often seen as an intellectual hobby, and writing books is respected. Yet, they were rather disregarded in the Georgian era, 1714 to 1832. So using her 1818, but written around the turn of the century, book, Northanger Abbey, Austen sought to support the validity of the novel. A synopsis of Northanger Abbey, for any viewer who may require it. Northanger Abbey tells the story of its heroine, 17-year-old Catherine Morland, who is fanatical about gothic novels. She travels to Bath, one of the main gatherings of high society, and meets the charming Mr Tilney. Catherine becomes intrigued by Tilney's family seat, Northanger Abbey, which she imagines as a great gothic haven of mystery and murder. But once at the Abbey, she soon learns the repercussions of her overactive imagination. Attitudes towards reading in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. A feminine and dangerous pastime. Novels were most often read by girls and women. Boys and men usually preoccupied themselves with much more suitable work, such as histories and science books. People were often disturbed by the effect of reading novels on these young girls. They were dramatic, uncensored, and just so darn frivolous. Northanger Abbey plays with the potential corruption of a girl's mind via excessive reading, with amusing results. But back to talking about the painting, um, I've slowly been building up the colours with layers and layers of watercolour washes, mostly wet on wet. Um, this does become a bit obsolete because I like to cover this up with gouache, but we'll get to that soon. Um, so yeah, basically this was one of the first watercolour paintings I had done in ages. And so I really should have done like a test or a practice before tackling a big piece because I'm going to use this, uh, image for a magazine actually. Uh, so I really should have done a practice. It's fine. We got through it in the end. Uh, but you'll soon see that I do hit a bit of a block. Breakdown number one. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. I need to paint watercolour. Oh, God sakes. For God sakes, love, I don't know what I'm doing. Let's give it brown eyes. Bloody hell. I think it's something like that. 
We have a green eye. So I say contrast. Oh god, that's a bit too much green. Don't do that much. Oh god, that was kind of a rancid colour. That did not work out as planned. So anyway, continuing on back to the painting rather than my strange ramblings. I I had taken a break from this point from my first session of painting and I came back and I was just there like, what the hell do I do? Here I'm looking at my iPad, which I had my original sketch on, which I really, really liked. And I just didn't know how to make my painting look as nice as my sketch, um, which was really unfortunate. Um, and this is when I started jumping in with gouache. I was like, you know what, I'm gonna go for it. I can't, I can't remember how to do watercolor enough and I'm much more comfortable in gouache. So I went for it. So I'm just doing layers and layers of gouache and trying to somehow fix this painting and really bring some depth and vibrancy to it. Books and reading in Northanger Abbey. The 1880 novel Northanger Abbey is a satirical take on the Gothic genre which is filled with thunderstorms, murder, kidnapping and melodrama. The book plays with elements of this genre as well as discussing the nature of novels. In the first line of the book, we are introduced to our protagonist. No one who had ever seen Catherine Morland in her infancy would have supposed her to be born a heroine. Austen from the get-go uses self-awareness and references to the structure of the novel itself, its heroine, the main player of the plot. While setting the scenes of Catherine's life, Austen notes departures from the usual gothic tropes. Mr Morland was not in the least addicted to locking up his daughters, and Mrs Morland, instead of dying bringing the latter, Catherine, into the world as anybody might expect, she lived on. The first chapter breaks reader expectations and sets the stage for the satirisation to follow. Catherine Morland is obsessed with books, particularly those of a gothic nature a genre filled with dramatic events and horror elements. But from 15 to 17, she was in training for a heroine. She read all such works as heroines must read. This obsession causes her wild imagining. Such effects some people believe to be caused by an overconsumption of such ruinous materials books. One imagining of Catherine's includes an episode in her stay at the titular abbey. The night was stormy. The wind had been rising at intervals the whole afternoon, and by the time the party broke up, it blew and rained violently. When she heard the wind rage round a corner of the ancient building and close with a sudden fury a distant door, felt for the first time she was really in an abbey. Yes, these were the characteristic sounds. They brought to her a recollection of countless variety of dreadful situations and horrid scenes. Catherine spots a dark cabinet and opens it to find some mysterious papers. The manuscript was so wonderfully found. What could it contain? To whom could it relate? And how singularly strange that it should fall to her lot to discover it. Catherine decides to read the paper in the morning. Her greedy eye glanced rapidly over a page. She stared at its import. Could it be possible? Or did her senses play her false? An inventory of linen in coarse and modern characters seemed all that was before her, such as the collection of papers which had filled her with such expectation and alarm and robbed her of half her night's rest. She felt humbled to the dust. Nothing could be clearer now than the absurdity of her recent fancies. Chapter 21 Catherine's imagination is a playful turn on the idea of the damaging effects of novel reading. For the most part, her ideas are largely inconsequential and do not harm anyone, as in this scene, where she hoped the paper she found would be of a significant nature. However, towards the end of the book, her imaginings become more harmful. Catherine is not the only character to have opinions on books. Her new friend, Isabella Thorpe, likes gothic novels and a pastime of the friends is to read novels together. Yes, novels. See how Austen's tone sneaks in there with the affirmation that they were indeed reading novels. In contrast, Isabella's brother, the rather intolerable John Thorpe, seems to dislike books. In one conversation with Catherine, they speak of them. Have you ever read Udolpho, Mr Thorpe? Udolpho? Oh Lord, no. Not I. I never read novels. I have something else to do. Catherine, humbled and ashamed, was going to apologise for her question, but he prevented her by saying, 
Novels are so full of nonsense and stuff. There's not been a tolerably decent one come out since Tom Jones. Except the monk. I read that t'other day, but as for all the others, I think they are the stupidest things in creation. I think you must like Udolfo if you were to read it. It is so very interesting. <laughs> not I, faith. No, if I read any, it shall be Mrs. Radcliffe's. Her novels are amusing enough. They are worth reading. Some fun and nature in them. Udolfo was written by Mrs. Radcliffe, said Catherine, with some hesitation from the fear of mortifying him. Chapter 7 Austin contrasts John Thorpe with Henry Tilney, Catherine's main love interest, and grossly underrated Austin hero. Come on, guys. Get it together. We love Henry Tilney. While John Thorpe is a bit of a dunce, very much for dunce, uh, and protests he does not see much worth in books, Tilney is witty and revels in reading them. I never look at it, said Catherine, as they walked along the side of the river, without thinking of the south of France. You have been abroad, then? said Henry, a little surprised. Oh, no, I only mean what I have read about. It always puts me in mind of the country that Emily and her father travelled through in the mysteries of Udolpho. But you never read novels, I dare say. Why not? Because they're not clever enough for you. Gentlemen read better books. The person, be it gentleman or lady, who has not the pleasure in a good novel must be intolerably stupid. I have read all Mrs. Radcliffe's works, and most of them with great pleasure. The mysteries of Udolpho, when I had once begun it, I could not lay it down again. I remember finishing it in two days, my hair standing on end the whole time. I am very glad to hear it, and now I shall never be ashamed of liking Udolpho myself. But I really thought before, young men despise novels amazingly. Chapter 29 this contrasts the unsuitable to the suitable love interest, Austin using whether or not a gentleman reads novels as an indicator of his character. The rather unfortunate Mr. Collins in Pride and Prejudice himself proclaims that he never read novels. That doesn't bode well for him. And by this point, I was, you know, still doing the painting and I was still trying to build it up. And I was just getting sick of it. I was just getting sick of looking at this thing because I was doing, at this point, I've been doing it for kind of like sort of two, three straight days. Um, and I just was struggling. I was getting blocked and I was getting frustrated. So I took a bit of a break and I'll elaborate a bit more in a few more moments. Breakdown number two. Now, my painting is going to look very, very different from when you last saw it. As I said, I was really struggling and I just needed to turn the camera off and I took two weeks away and just really slowly built up the painting. But because this is a little unfair on you guys, because you don't get to see any of the process, I have done a recreation of how I felt during this challenging time. So welcome back to the painting. I hope you enjoyed that. I don't know how that idea came into my mind. I just think I was like, oh God, I feel bad because they've watched this whole process and they don't get to see half the painting because it looks completely different. Then I thought, oh, I could do a little sketch. And then I did it and then I filmed it and I wasn't gonna have any music. And I thought, oh wait, let's put some music to it. I was thinking the apprentice theme, you know, the dun 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 dun. And then I thought, no, 
Hall of the Mountain King, great for increasing anxiety. Um, so I put that along it and surprisingly it really, really fit for me not like actually doing it to that music. Um, so I had a bit of fun doing that, spent probably too much time editing that instead of doing my actual work I need to do. It's fine, I'm not, I'm fine, I'm not having another breakdown. Um, but anyway, so the process of this in terms of the painting, moving away from breakdowns, um, was just building up colour, going layer by layer, try not to lose my mind again. It definitely got a lot better and I felt a lot more secure in what I was doing. Um, so yeah, it was just layering on with gouache, different, you know, thicker layers as I, as I kept on going and adding the details and adding refinements. Anyway, that's all I can think of to say in terms of artsy stuff. Uh, let's continue learning about Northanger Abbey and reading during the 19th century. Austen's defense of the novel. While discussions of novels are scattered throughout the book, the main defense from Austen comes in chapter five. Yes, novels, for I will not adopt that ungenerous and impolitic custom so common with novel writers of degrading their contemptuous censure the very performances to the number of which they are themselves adding, joining with their greatest enemies in bestowing the harshest epithets on such works, and scarcely ever permitting them to be read by their own heroine, who, if she accidentally take up a novel, is sure to turn over its insipid pages with disgust. Alas, if the heroine of one novel be not patronised by the heroine of another, from whom can she expect protection and regard? I cannot approve of it. Let us leave it to the reviewers to abuse such effusions of fancy at their leisure, and over every new novel to talk in threadbare strains of the trash which with the press now groans. Here Austin references the ungenerous custom of some authors who, during the course of their own work, decry other novels while promoting their own. Samuel Richardson in Clarissa, 1748, has one of his male characters speak of inflaming novels that present idle and improbable romances which weaken the minds of women. Clearly this is rather hypocritical, a novel condemning other novels. Another example of this can be found in the preface to Maria Edgeworth's Belinda, 1801, where it states, The following work is offered to the public as a moral tale, the author not wishing to acknowledge it a novel. Let us not desert one another. We are an injured body. Although our productions have afforded more extensive and unaffected pleasure than those of any other literary corporation in the world, no species of composition has been so much decried. And while the abilities of the 900th abridger of the history of England, or of the man who collects and publishes in a volume some dozen lines of Milton, Pope and Prior, are eulogised by a thousand pens, there seems almost a general wish of decrying the capacity and undervaluing the labour of the novelist, and of citing the performances which have only genius, wit and taste to recommend them. Austen suggests that the injured body, writers, should band together, and despite the enjoyment that can be borne from reading, no other type of book has been so condemned. She also criticises the praised works of other writers who are less inventive and rehashed old ideas or texts. She names poets who are long dead. When Austen was young, she even wrote her own small history of England by a partial, prejudiced and ignorant historian, as she called herself. In it, she played with the pompous tone of previous historians of England. She also points out the undervalued nature of the novelist and how novels only have genius, wit and taste to recommend them once again playing with tone. I am no novel reader. I seldom look into novels. Do not imagine that I often read novels. It is really well for a novel. Such is the common cant. Ah, what are you reading, miss? Oh, it is only a novel, replies the young lady while she lays down her book with affected difference or momentary shame. It is only Cecilia or Camilla or Belinda or, in short, only some work in which the greatest powers of the mind are displayed, in which the most thorough knowledge of human nature, the happiest delineation of its varieties, the liveliest effusions of wit and humour are conveyed to the world in the best chosen language. Austin creates a conversation that she would have heard many, many times, people diminishing the novel and being made to feel shame for reading them. 
Austen genders the speakers too. The person who is no novel reader is a gentleman, while the reader is a lady. Austen suggests that the book the lady may have been reading was Camilla, Cecilia or Belinda, novels by Frances Burney and Mariah Edgeworth, which were published in the 1780s and 90s. Frances Burney, as mentioned earlier, and Mariah Edgeworth both complained of other novels while promoting their own. Austen does not follow suit. She puts novels on a pedestal, praising them for their mastery of human nature, wit and well-chosen language. She boldly states how the greatest powers of the mind are displayed, countering the idea that novels were unintellectual in comparison to books on history or science. Here comes Austen's most direct defence of the novel. As explored earlier, conversations on the value of novels are peppered throughout the rest of Northanger Abbey. Conclusion Jane Austen departed from the usual actions of her predecessors, disparaging other books while promoting their own. She championed the value of the novel in intellectuality, entertainment and craft. And to the last, Austen played with the self-aware nature of Northanger Abbey. She satirically asked the reader what the moral lesson of the book is. And I'll leave it to the 2007 Jane Austen adaptation of Northanger Abbey to deliver this final quote which is slightly abridged. I leave it to be settled whether the tendency of this story be to recommend parental tyranny or reward filial disobedience. So that is the painting finally complete. Um, if you think the background looks unfinished, it kind of is, but I technically didn't need to do it. For the magazine, all I needed to do was Catherine reading a book, so that's why it's got the white outline as well, so I can really easily scan it and remove the background. Um, I'm actually really proud of this piece, so I hope you enjoyed watching this and learning about Northanger Abbey. Thank you!